Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and welcome to the 35th International Churchill Conference. It's wonderful to see you all again. I'm David Freeman, Director of Publications for the Churchill Society, which is another way of saying I'm the editor of Finest Hour. And uh, once, once again, again. <laughs> thank you. Once, once again, it is my honor to serve as uh, your host for th this year's conference. We are going to begin by watching a video of the award ceremony that took place last week in London. And I cannot tell you how much pride it is for me to present award to a very great lady, my friend, Jane Williams. As an advocate and a champion for women in science and for gender equality, there is no question, there is no finer role model for the next generation than Dame Athena Donald. invisible line that separates the good and the great in any walk of society. Stephen Rubin has indeed crossed that line and is clearly amongst the pantheon of the greats. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me very great pleasure to announce that this year's Churchill Award for Literacy goes to Andrew Roberts. The way in which he was able to say something that he believed again and again, and he had such eloquence in saying it. And that eloquence ultimately derived not from tricks of the trade, um, but from his instinctive belief in what he was saying. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to introduce the chairman of the International Churchill Society, Mr. Lawrence Geller. It's a, it's a grave challenge to follow Andrew Roberts on the screen and the stentorian qualities of young Freeman. So uh, I hope you'll bear with me. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And what a wonderful evening it was last night. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the start of our 35th International Conference here in uh, Colonial Williamsburg during our 50th anniversary year. Colonial Williamsburg is a unique and frankly amazing venue that is an essential part of the fabric of the United States. And it stands as a place that spoke up for centuries for freedom and liberty. That's the reason why successive presidents of the United States have spent time here. They know that f without learning from the past, they're doomed to repeat the same mistakes. It's also the reason, as you've seen from these magnificent photos outside, that on March the 8th, 1946, Churchill and General Eisenhower visited Williamsburg just three days after the famous Iron Curtain speech at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri with President Truman. And all of this is a precursor of why we're here in Williamsburg today. For defending freedom and liberty was indeed Churchill's call to action. And how appropriate is we gather today for in addition, in addition to tomorrow being a time when we remember those who fell in the so-called Great War a hundred years ago when the armistice was called, we celebrate tomorrow. But propitiously, yesterday was the 80th anniversary of Kristallnacht, that heinous symbol of an evil dictator's gruesome ambitions. It was also the 29th anniversary of the falling of the Berlin Wall, 
a grim reminder that dictators keep their population prisoners and away from freedom, trust, and freedom and liberty. Today I want to speak to you briefly about what you'll see and hear over the course of the conference, also about what we've been doing since our last conference, and about a quantum step forward we've taken to fulfilling our mission. And I want to accomplish four things this morning. Firstly, to recognize some key people without whom this would not be a reality. Secondly, to review what we achieved and to tell you our plans. Thirdly, to discuss some relevance of modern day global political issues and the similarity, similarity with those which Churchill would have encountered. And finally, and I can't, you know I can't go without it, I want to mention the real and immediate need for further financial support with the launching of our Heritage Fund afield. So firstly, I want to thank all of the great team at Colonial Williamsburg for working so tirelessly on our behalf. And I think last evening was indeed magical. No team could have produced it better. I want to particularly thank a very fine Churchillian, Mitchell Rees, who, who is Colonial Williamsburg Foundation's truly brilliant, energetic, and far-sighted CEO. His generosity of mind, heart, and spirit, and wallet, made this conference possible. And under his strong and determined leadership, Colonial Williamsburg, Williamsburg now stands healthy and certain of its todays and tomorrows. This place is a shining example for us. It's a sign of the importance of what we do that we have such a wide array of sponsors who've been amazingly generous. If you look at the back of the program, you'll see their ads, and it's astonishing the variety of people who believe in our cause. And we thank each one of them for their commitment. Because simply stated, without their generosity, we couldn't afford to mount these conferences. This conference features many of the finest authors of recently published Churchill works. You'll hear them link the past to today. We have interviews on current topics, always learning from the past, and much anticipated remarks at our dinner this evening from recently retired Supreme Court Justice Kennedy. He will then be interviewed by that fine historian and dedicated Churchillian, the ever shy and retiring Chris Matthews. Our mission is simple and it's to heed Mary Soane's instructions to keep the memory green and to ensure that the lessons learned from Churchill's life reach many more ears, hearts, and minds than we have ever done before, especially those who have a role in shaping our todays and our tomorrows. And we must never forget that those, to fail, those that fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it, as Churchill reminded us in 1948. As an organization, we've come a long way from the dark days of the late 90s, when both the UK and the US Churchill Centers, as they were then known, had empty coffers and waning memberships, and were perpetually struggling to keep their own financial lights on and to find a clear reason for being, while at the same time, the memories of Churchill and his astonishing le legacy were becoming increasingly fainter. We were competing for attention with other organizations, in particular the National Churchill Museum and the American Friends of the War Rooms and the Churchill Museum in London, who, with whom we merged some years ago. I call those years, those grim years, our wilderness years. Fortunately, they've been left behind as we rebuilt, promoted, pushed, and raised money. Importantly, the new ICS was formed as a result of the merger of the Churchill Center and the Association of Fellows of the National Churchill Museum. Now the bonds with organizations such as Chartwell, Blenheim, the archives of Cambridge College, College grow ever stronger. Importantly, following the lead of Mary Soames, Churchill's grandson Winston, his son Randolph, the irrepre irrepressible Celia and the very talented Edwina Sands, she of Indian heritage. <laughs> and of course, Minnie and Jenny Churchill, and so more of the Churchill family, they've worked side by side with ICS, and they've allowed us to bring the memory of Churchill very much into the forefront of the public eye. 
and I thank them, we thank them, for entrusting us with their family's legacy. As the amazing and crowd-filled celebrations of the 50th anniversary of Churchill's passing proved in 2015, the society by then had exceeded and succeeded everybody's expectations. Through over three decades of blood, toil, tears, and sweat, we never once wavered in our duty and were finally at the end of the beginning. At last, we could take the next step of our long and essential journey, which two years ago at our conference in DC included the long-awaited and hard-fought-for National Churchill Library and Center on the campus of the famed George Washington University in DC, a stone's throw away from Toggy Bottom. We will be forever grateful for our partnerships with, with George Washington University, and I thank their, their past presidents, Trachtenberg and Knapp, and their current president, LeBlanc, for their unwavering belief in our cause, and especially the Dean of Libraries, Geneva Henry, for her patience and her belief in our mission. And when I say patience, mostly it was patience with me, and I'm very, very grateful that at the ribbon cutting, when she was armed with these large scissors, that she didn't murder me. That was her chance. 2018 has been an eventful year for the International Churchill Society and for Churchillians everywhere. And unapologetically, I will proudly take the time to enumerate your society's activities, for there is not a scintilla of doubt that we have significantly contributed to the ever-increasing momentum in the world of Churchill. Major new works by such ama amazing and accomplished authors as there are at this conference have brought fresh insights and perspectives, and yet more scholarship is on its way. We renewed our vigor and determination to work more closely with and better support our all-important chapters who can and do offer so much to keeping the memory green. Major films about Churchill and World War II are abounding causing a massive increase in awareness about all things Churchill. Darkest Hour, as you obviously know, garnered a plethora of coveted awards, while films such as Dunkirk and others added to our lion's roar. The National Churchill Library and Center uh, at the uh, GW in Washington continues to grow into it, its rightful position in the very heart of our nation's capital, with its expanding collections, seminars, and very successful series, Churchill Conversations. Our UK organization's Churchill Interviews series began, in the, began last year with an interview of Sir John Major by Lord Marland, followed up last week, follow up by last week's uh, interv interview at the annual fundraising dinner with the always amazing Andrew Roberts, conducted by a British Secretary of Stra State, Michael Gove. In 2019, however, a full rollout of this important bicontinental interview series is planned both here and in the UK, and will be dealing with matters of historic and current re relevance. These video interviews will be live streamed where possible, always on our website, and widely distributed through a variety of social media channels. The exhibition Churchill Shakespeare opened last month to critical acclaim in Washington, D.C.'s Folger Shakespeare Library. It, frankly, it was inspiring that two of Britain's finest sons are linked together in the shadow of this great nation's capital building. The National Churchill Museum in Fulton goes from strength to strength, its outreach programs being increasingly successful. And as Randolph mentioned, next May celebrates its own 50th anniversary. The Pentland-sponsored Churchill poster design competition expands and flourishes in the UK. And this year's English-speaking union, uh, Churchill National P Public Speaking Competition for Schools, once again provided a unique national platform for so many talented young people. The historic Long Beach-based Queen Mary launched a new Churchill exhibit built around the Churchill War Room sets from the movie Darkest Hour. Our digitized Churchill Archive for Schools program is providing free and regularly updated lessons and teaching modules to high school students throughout the world free. It continually expands its reach and its numbers with nearly 1,500 schools 
currently participating. But that number is not enough, and we need all of your help and that of all of our chapters to in this increasing number of schools. We have to expand its reach as we increase its scope. For this single program, combined with our burgeoning scholarship and fellowship programs, provides a brief, be bespoke and unique Churchill education infrastructure that should excite and entice generations of future Churchill scholars. Okay, we're now in a position to take our long-awaited and much-needed next steps and are launching our truly important and ever-widening range of scholarship and fellowship programs in the U.S. and the U.K. And in 2019, we will see the fundamental rollout of this program. But I'm delighted today to tell you about the launch of the first of such programs. They're named and sponsored in many cases, and they're in partnerships with universities on both sides of the Atlantic. The first is the innovative Churchill Pentland Scholarship. This is organized by a transatlantic relationship between ICS, University College London, the School of Public Policy, and New York University's Wagner. The first of two annual scholarships will be awarded, I say that's wrong, it's the first two scholarships will be awarded for the 2019-2020 academic year. Candidates, will be residents of low or middle income countries as defined by the World Bank. And each scholarship recipient will have to demonstrate a commitment to improving public service and administration for the populations of their, their countries and similar countries. I'm also pleased to announce yet another generous gift from the Harry and Alice Stillman Foundation to the Churchill Li Na National Churchill Library and Center. It will enable much needed research activities and will be overseen and executed by GW. These fellowships will be focused on topics of relevance to Winston Churchill and his example of global leadership. Preference will be given to scholarships to projects that emphasize the relevance of Churchill's leadership to current affairs. The awardees will be called the National Churchill Library and Center Undergraduates or graduate research fellows, for there are two programs, and at least 10 fellowships will be offered annually. I thank Roger Stillman for his support, hard work, love of history. He does epitomize Churchillian va values, and we are lucky to be of common cause with him. Finally, I think I have to talk about an impending partnership. And why am I talking about something that's not finalized? Because we're here in Colonial Williamsburg, proximate to William and Mary, University, which is the home of the Harriman Fellowship pro found, uh, Program, named, of course, in honor of the exceptional Pamela Harriman, Jenny and Randolph's grandma. This program places interns in the United States embassies in London and Paris, and also in the State Department. We are working with them to provide two additional scholarships to this program, and if we get it done, it will become even stronger as we achieve our asp aspirations of expanding it further on both sides of the Atlantic. Partnerships with such venerated institutions, each offering different and distinctive but very complementary programs, are all part of a long-term, multi-dimension, mission-driven plan that we've developed. We believe they will stimulate and attract generations to come they're exciting and competitive. They will reach the minds we haven't been able yet to sustainably attract. And I have no delusions. This is an essential part towards fulfilling our mission, and it's long awaited. Finest Hour goes from strength to strength and stands ever taller amongst all such publications. While the Churchill Bulletin reaches some 40,000 people with each edition, and our website now gets over two million hits annually. That's good, but for the first time, over 40% of the website's traffic comes from the 18 to 34 year old demographic group. That is a healthy sign and trend for our future. Our daily social media program increasingly improves with widening, in preach, uh, widening reach to greater numbers. And look around you today, our conferences delved ever further into the life of the great man as we understand not only his past, but increasingly promulgate the lessons learned to influence the future. 
Next year's conference will be in Washington, D.C., the end of October, and I'm pleased to say that the 2020 annual conference will be held in September at Churchill College, Cambridge. They are must-attend events. For me, it's also very pleasing to see more and more Churchill programs, events, exhibitions we have nothing to do with but grow organically as interest in Churchill increases every year. Know that it is no accident that Chartwell and Blenheim thrive today as never before and research figures continue to increase at the Churchill Archives Center in Churchill College, Cambridge. That is an indication to me of the great scholarship that lies ahead while all the while, all the time, queues waiting to go into the Churchill War Rooms and Museum in London stretch ever further. History with its flickering light, Churchill said in 1940, stumbles along the trail of the past, trying to reconstruct its scenes, to revive its echoes and kindle pale gleams, with pale gleams the passion of former days. In, your, in the past, your generosity, support, and hard work have helped that lamb, lamp burn ever more brightly. But the flickering lamp, it also, in, it also illuminates our increasingly troubled present. So as we look around the turbulent, fragile, and dangerous world today, it's easy to see that we're not at the end of history or at the end of some brave, brave new world, but are still dealing with legacies of the past. We are still fighting the sort of bat battles that would be recognizable to Churchill in his day and sadly or too familiar. Populism, autocracy, despotism are on the rise again. Would-be dictators don their mantles of repression. The turmoil in the Middle East grows unabated. Russia, China, Iran ambitiously and ruthlessly expand their regions of influence. Personal summiteering the rise of feminism, Brexit, the special relationship, nationalism, isolationism, the decline of the UK mili military resources, all issues from the past relentlessly, relentlessly keep appearing in one guise or another. Lady Soames quite rightly used to caution us against trying to presume what her father would do or say in response to the latest news. That's right, and we won't. But we can be certain of one thing. He would not have done nothing, and he would not have said nothing. I personally feel sure he'd have thrown himself into the debate, and he would have spoken out where he saw wrongdoing. He would have sought to take action this day. We also know the, pr the principles that I believe he would have asserted, defending the values that have shaped our democracy, freedom of speech, equality under the law, free and fair elections, speaking up for the British national interest and prestige, speaking up for freedom and democracy wherever in the world, opposing totalitarianism of whatever political creed, standing up against the persecution of minorities, advocating scientific progress and the benefits of technology for all. He would not have pandered to instant polling in short, he would have been uniquely Churchill. We believe we have a duty to learn from that past and do what we can to influence the future, our future, the future of generations to come. But we also recognize that we need to help create the Churchills of the future, enabling them to speak truth to power, helping them articulate their vision, and giving them the skills to shape their destiny and influence society for the better, that's why I'm asking for your much-needed financial support if we're to fill our, our, our really important mission. Your financial contributions help us quickly implement and expand these costly and very important programs. As you know, and I know all too well, fundraising is increasingly competitive, professional, and difficult. Raising restricted funds, unrestricted funds for general purpose is harder than ever before. Adowment, endowments are desperately hard to raise money for, but we have no cho choice but to can you continue to do so. But it can't be our only method. So we've determined that we'll seek funds for specific and nameable purposes, 
such as the Churchill Pentland Scho uh, Scholarships, the Churchill Archives for School, and the NCL fe NCLC Fellowships at George Washington, hopefully fellowships at William and Mary. We know we must raise funds for these programs on a multi-year basis, from our fellowships and scholarships, research projects to seminars, from the interview series to conferences. Each will have amount, amount needed and will be funded by specific restricted gift giving with associated naming rights. This is our future, this is our norm. And that's where you, our fellow Churchillians, and where our corporate sponsors come in. That's why our Heritage Fund, this year's appeal starts today. And we will use these for fund projects from those I've described today. We're rolling out this appeal every way we can and we ask you to give as generously as possible. Know that we as a society have, I believe, done magnificent work with our meager and skinny resources and have proven ourselves not only able custodians of Churchill legacies, but truly worthy of your future generosity. Our work's cut out. We have three, focus, three focuses to work on. Our programs such as education, conferences, scholarship, research, and seminars, our fundamental core value. Our interview series and our communication activities, essential to relevance today and all of the time, all of the time, fundraising, fundraising, and fundraising. For it is that essential ingredient that makes everything possible. And I can assure you, we will give passionately of ourselves. We will give more blood, toil, sweat, and tears with all our hearts and energy to match your generosity, all in the name of Britain's finest son, the one man who kept the flame of freedom burning through so many bleak and daunting years and whose leadership skills are so crucially, crucially needed by today's current and would-be leaders. We can't do it without you, so please, action this day. Ask yourself, if not me, who? If not now, when? So enjoy. Now I've tried to pick your pockets. Enjoy both this conference and this amazing setting in Colonial Williamsburg. Take from, our, take from this conference the wealth of wisdom, knowledge, and scholarship. It's on array, it's, unappara, it's unparalleled, and it's all assembled in the memory of the man who so greatly influenced the course of events and shaped the lives of those who enjoy democracy today. And thank heavens, and I do thank heaven, was ever the bold, courageous, and unrelenting leader and defender of liberty and freedom. That's why we're here, and I thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, to speak to you for briefly for a few moments, our executive director, Mr. Michael Bishop. Thank you, David. And thank you, Lawrence, for your remarks and your leadership. And thanks also to our vice chairman, Jean-Paul Montepay, for all that you do. We have with us this weekend a number of distinguished International Churchill Society board members, and we thank them for their time, energy, and generosity. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the 35th International Churchill Conference. It's fitting and proper that we should meet in Colonial Williamsburg, one of the cradles of democracy, a form of government that he did so much to save. Let me express my gratitude to the members of the Churchill family, Minnie, Randolph, and Jenny Churchill, and Edwina Sands, for gathering with us this weekend and for their continued support of our cause. And thanks to all our many generous sponsors, but particularly to the Corinne and Lenny Sands Foundation. Lenny, who sadly could not be with us this weekend, is a stalwart and generous friend of the International Churchill Society and a constant source of wisdom and inspiration to us all. The theme of our conference is Walking with Destiny, which recalls Churchill's famous reflections on the moment when with his nation and the world in peril, ultimate power finally came to him in 1940. As he later wrote, thus then on the night of the 10th of May, at the outset of this mighty battle, I acquired the chief power in the state, 
During these last crowded days of the political crisis, my pulse had not quickened at any moment. I took it all as it came, but I cannot conceal from the reader of this truthful account that as I went to bed at about 3 a.m., I was conscious of a profound sense of relief. At last, I had the authority to give directions over the whole scene. I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. This weekend in Williamsburg, we will join Churchill in his walk with destiny, exploring facets of his life and leadership with some of the most distinguished scholars and leaders of our day. Familiar friends such as Alan Packwood and Sir David Canadine will debut their important new books about Churchill's decision-making and painting, respectively. We will also hear from first-time speakers and younger scholars. Dan Todman will look at Churchill's difficult and pivotal experiences in 1942, and Felix Close, the historian and candidate for the European Parliament, will explore Churchill's passion for European unity with its obvious relevance to the ongoing Brexit process. The entertaining and erudite Giles Milton will show us that Churchill, though a gentleman, was prepared when necessary to use ungentlemanly means to achieve victory. Mitchell Reese, a former senior diplomat and special envoy to Northern Ireland and North Korea, and now the president and CEO of Colonia Williamsburg, will join foreign affairs commentator and biographer of Castlereagh and Clement Attlee, John Bew, to apply the lessons of Churchill's life and career to the diplomatic challenges that continue to face us the world over. Our conference will cultivate culminate, fittingly enough, with the triumphant launch of the brilliant new Churchill, Walking with Destiny by Andrew Roberts. And of course, we are honored to welcome the recently retired Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Anthony M. Kennedy, who will deliver the keynote this evening and reflect upon the challenges of leadership from the unique vantage point of one who served for decades on the nation's highest court and who emerged as the key vote on many of the most challenging cases of our time. We are met on a weekend of great significance. Tomorrow marks the centenary of the armistice that ended the First World War. In homage, we will pause on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month to offer tribute in prose, poetry, and music to those who fought and fell. Later today, we will hear from Ed Lengel in conversation with Rob Havers, who will discuss the fighting man in World War I and the legacy of that conflict for the men and women in uniform today. We will distribute poppies from the British Legion, that powerful symbol of remembrance to all attendees to wear tomorrow. In the coming years, we will renew our efforts to coordinate and promote the efforts of our chapters around the country those little platoons, in the phrase of Edmund Burke, that stimulate an interest in Churchill in communities all over the United States. I am pleased that the chapter chairs gathered yesterday to discuss strategy and best practices, and were joined by Randolph, Lawrence, Jenny, and myself. Congratulations to Stacy Terrace, the dynamic leader of the Churchill Society of Wisconsin, on his richly deserved Chartwell Award. And we are committed to working with him and the other chapter leaders, new and well-established, to harness the energy of the chapters and ensure that ICS thrives now and in the future. As Lawrence mentioned, last month saw the culmination of a two-year effort of the International Churchill Society in collaboration with the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., with the opening of Churchill's Shakespeare. This wonderful exhibition features documents and artifacts from the Churchill Archive Center Chartwell, and The Folger. The show will close on January 6, and I urge you all to visit The Folger if you can. Much of what we do is achieved through the remarkable array of leaders and speakers who so generously donate their time, the sponsors who make this conference and much else possible, and the hard work of our board and staff. Speaking of the latter, I would like to thank the staff members who have helped make this conference a success. David Freeman, Aaron Minov, Justin Reich, and John Olson. They, thank you. They and our volunteers are here to assist you this weekend 
as we celebrate the life and career of Winston Churchill and explore the many ways history with its flickering lamp can illuminate the present. But our efforts would come to nothing without you. Our members, and the future members I trust we have among us, are the lifeblood of our organization. As our chairman reminded us, your generosity is key to helping us achieve our goals. This year, our conference marks the start of our Heritage Fund drive, details of which can be found in your registration packet and throughout this room. I can neither confirm nor deny reports that Lawrence has been slipping copies under your pillow in your hotel rooms, but I wouldn't put it past him. So you can avoid that fate by giving to the Heritage Fund over and above your continued membership. It's necessary to the continued survival and strength of the International Churchill Society, and please give as generously as you can. And now let us begin our own walk with destiny and enjoy a weekend of enlightenment and fellowship in this beautiful and historic place. Thank you. <laughs>